So the aspect of mindfulness, the more present we are with all aspects of our experience, then the more satisfaction, the more satisfying that experience is going to be. So that we're having the experience in a deeper way. We're not just skiing at that point, but we're actually communing with our body and with nature and with the sights and sounds and our own emotions about that whole experience. And all of that is flowing through us, not just the turns and the descent or the ascent. So I started teaching meditation about almost 20 years ago. And I studied with several well-known teachers, including Shinzen Young and Ajashanti and Eric Kolvig. It, it's not dangerous to have the feeling. It's, it's actually dangerous to repress it. Because if you tend to that feeling, if you're fully present with it, then at a certain point, that can actually build confidence because you're not in denial. You're openly acknowledging that here's fear, here's danger, that's, that's life. Life doesn't want to die. Life wants to live. And then if you openly acknowledge that, then there's no energy put into repressing it. And then that energy is available to be present. That's one less thing that you're not present with. And in our normal lives, we all know that we're mortal. We all know that we're going to die. We all know that we can get injured very easily, that our bodies are fairly robust and also fairly fragile. And so being out in wilderness environments, especially in the winter, makes us so aware of just how fragile we are. Because if you don't do A, B, and C, you could easily freeze to death or lose a body part to frostbite or fall and nobody would know where the hell you are until it was too late. And so our psyches are aware of that. Whether we're going to pay attention to that or not, our psyche is aware of it. So having the ability to mindfully stay with those emotions and those thoughts without believing that they're true. In other words, they aren't happening right now, but they could happen. So there's a, so there's a sense of, okay, this could happen and I'm fragile and I'm vulnerable and here I am. And then just letting that feeling be fully present with that feeling in the body, that emotion and those thoughts without believing that they're happening because they're not. Now, if they are, then that's a different set of circumstances. At that point, forget the meditation and figure out how to save yourself. But if we're just, let's say, happily skiing and the view is beautiful and all of a sudden you have the thought, wow, I'm way out here if I fall and nobody, and I'm alone, let's say, or um, I'm behind my friends and they may not know where to turn around and find me, etc., then I'm vulnerable and that's dangerous. And you have that thought and then you have that feeling, then it's okay to just stay with that. Now, if, if you're tending, like if you're not an emotionally or psychologically healthy person, and without that denial, you cascade into a total terror, anxiety attack, well, that's a different story. Then you maybe shouldn't be on that trip. Because if something does happen and you panic and you freak out, then you're a danger to yourself and all the people who are, are with you. So I'm speaking about a person who has a certain degree of psychological and emotional health and maturity can face their demons. And one of the cool things about being out in wilderness is you can face your demons. I, I can't tell you how many times I've woken up at night with, you know, with that terror of holy shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, I backpacked onto a ridge in the Sierras and, and I took off my boots to like let my feet relax and I was up on this knife edge ridge and one of my boots fell off the ridge. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I am so fucked. <laughs> and luckily it, it didn't go that far and it, it, this rock just grabbed it. And it was like, you know, was the boot going to go 50 feet or was it going to go five feet or was it going to go 500 feet? So I put on the other boot and hobbled down and grabbed it. It wasn't that far, but it, it was just like that moment of, whoa, I am way exposed up here. I was solo. I was a week in on a trip. I was off the trail. Okay, here we are in this activity and we're going to talk with what brings us more into presence with the activity or keeps us safe or keeps us cohered as a group. 
but not necessarily talk about, oh, our boyfriends and girlfriends or husbands and wives and kids and parents and blah, 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 and jobs and, you know, all the trips that we have planned for this summer, like how often on an activity and then you talk about all the trips you did and all the ones you're going to do and, oh, well, I was here and I was there. And, well, wh why talk about the one that you did when you're not even present with the one that you're doing? <laughs> um, so, you know, it just depends on the intention of the group, how you put together a group. So this, this ability to really look at our own motivations, our own thoughts and our own emotions with a certain amount of objectivity and clarity and distance is a, a fundamental skill of mindfulness, but it doesn't come that easily to some people. It may not be your natural way of thinking so that we just kind of take our first thought at face value about why we're doing something. When in fact, why we're doing something is kind of a mystery. It's a deep mystery of motivations on different levels and it takes a certain amount of introspective awareness or mindfulness or work to be able to look at that and, and look down through the levels and really understand why we're doing something. Why am I making this decision versus that decision? Because we tend to just do stuff choose stuff and then justify it afterwards and say, oh, I did this because of that. Well, maybe, but maybe not. And when decisions are basically putting our own lives or other people's lives at more or less risk, then it's important to be clear about why we're making them. And some of that can come from long training, just in being in those environments and making those decisions and watching other people make them and seeing how they work out. So you develop a depth of experience and then that can guide your decisions, which is incredibly important. But even within that context, people who are very experienced make crappy decisions and get into trouble. You know, you've got really experienced people and then they, they just say, oh, I thought it would work out. <laughs> it didn't. And maybe it was a fluke and maybe it was foreseeable. So that this is an important thing, to, I think, for people are going to spend a lot of time in wilderness environments to really be present with, well, why am I doing this? And why am I choosing this in this moment? So that's one reason to look at things more mindfully or train ourselves in mindfulness or meditation. And then you know, we all want days with fresh powder and sunshine. You know, those are great days. But what about days that aren't like that? And then it's like, how much suffering or angst is there over, oh, it isn't the way that I was hoping it was going to be. The snow isn't quite as fluffy as I wanted it to be. It's not as deep or... This, you know, it's too windy or it's too cold or it's too this or it's too that. And, and all of those comparisons get in the way. But if we're able to be mindful, if we're able to be aware, oh, those are just thoughts. Those thoughts aren't the truth. They aren't reality. The reality is what's happening right now, not in comparison to what I thought it was supposed to be or I wish it was. But the reality is just this, the way it is then this, the way it is, is wonderful. It's just fine. It doesn't have to be the way that we thought it was going to be. I was up in Montana skiing last week, and the trip was planned around the likelihood of powder. That was sort of, you know, well, hopefully there'll be powder. And we actually didn't have any fresh snow. The snow on the ground was pretty much from two weeks ago, where there was a lot of snow. So the snow's been blown, and it's been baked and it's been pushed around and it's a little bit harder and and but it was blue skies and the scenery is fantastic it was gorgeous so I could feel like at one point like on the second day I, I could just feel like this sort of like oh I wish there was powder oh and I, and, and I really planned and I wanted and I hoped and and I could just feel that I could hold on to that I could be with that and that would color my whole experience as being less than the whole experience would become what it wasn't. 
And, and then I said, yeah, but look at this place. It's so beautiful. And there's good coverage. And the sky is blue. And it's, it's just gorgeous. These mountains are fantastic. And if I focus on that, I'm going to be a lot happier. And I was actually able to just sort of feel that angst and that lack and that, that whole thing about the way I had hoped it was going to be. And I just fully felt that disappointment. And after about a minute of feeling that, it just went. And it didn't bother me. And would I have preferred it to be different? Well, at that point, it didn't matter. I was just there. And it was great. And we had a wonderful time. But it could easily have gone the other way if I wasn't mindfully aware of, oh, this is what's going on now. I'm starting to get into what, what could have been. And well, what good is that? So no matter what it is, it could be you know, any aspect of the experience, we can take it as, I wish it was different or it should be different. And then the whole way of being mindful with it is to notice those thoughts, notice those feelings, and then just notice what is and appreciate and enjoy that. People are teaching, teaching mindfulness meditation all over the country in many different forms in many different locations. And it's pretty easy to Google mindfulness or mindful, mindfulness meditation and find something, whether it's uh, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, or some kind of Buddhist meditation. And these techniques are universal. They belong to every culture. They're not, they're not necessarily um, belonging to any religion or any spiritual tradition, because every religion and every spiritual tradition has mindfulness meditation somewhere in there. We're calling it by a different name, of course but it's there.